Can you? Can I be heard? Oh, wow. Yes, I can. Um, just a, a very quick um, introduction, really, to say, firstly, thank you all for coming. Um, it promises to be a really good evening tonight where we're going to hear from some of the thought leaders in attribution, um, which in itself is an exciting thing. Um, I'm Luke Hater. I run Magnetic in Europe. And um, I'm just here to introduce our illustrious leader, James Green, who has something of a reputation as a, a raconteur. Um, but he's an Englishman, so we, we bonded on that. Um, and a few interesting facts about James before I um, let him take the stage. He sold his last business and then sold his house and then went off sailing around the world with his wife and children. You can find that um, on his blog via the Magnetic website. And something he tells me people are often interested in is that he also worked for Steve Jobs. Um, having set up this company under his auspices, I, I will tell you that he's um, a very entertaining man and, and obviously uh, an interesting thought leader on these topics which affect our industry. So with no further ado, I'll hand you over to James Green. Thank you very much. And. Uh, he said that because we're deciding what he gets as a bonus tomorrow. So, um, so we're going to talk about attribution tonight. We're going to start with a video. Um, I, I thought I'd just explain why we care about attribution because, as most of you know, Magnetic doesn't have anything to do with attribution. We don't offer a service. We're not involved in it. We're an innocent bystander. Um, but uh, a couple of years ago, we started to realize that people were treating our service in the same way and same breaths and same thought as site retargeting, which is a lower funnel. So we do search retargeting. We remember what people search for on a bunch of sites and then persuade them to go to your site by powering display, video, rich media ads. Um, and we realized that people were uh, holding us to the same metrics and thinking that we should perform exactly the same as someone who's already visited your site, expressed an interest in your brand. And we thought, well, that, that doesn't sort of work really. Um, so we started thinking about attribution and the more we learned, we thought it was interesting and so we thought we'd actually throw some panels. So this is actually I think the 10th one we've thrown. Um, uh, we have a great group of panelists. A couple of the guys who were on the first one are here tonight. I think you'll enjoy them. Um, uh, but with that, we're going to start it off with a little video. So cue the video. Every single time we generate an impression online, we generate a piece of data. At the user level, every single click, ad engagement, visit to a site, user search, and even a purchase equates to more and more data. Data is stored in different systems and is being used by various media partners for multiple advertising strategies. We are swimming in masses of amounts of data and have very few tools that create easy, actionable answers. With the right media measurement methodology in place, marketers can follow the consumer path from start to finish. We live in a world where it is almost impossible to live 60 seconds without seeing an ad. We have outdoor TV and the ever-expanding digital universe of online display, video and mobile. The rise of digital advertising creates more questions and sometimes concerns about what, where, when and how marketers should spend their media dollars. Without a solid attribution model in place, everything is called into question. Which creative was shown? Was it seen above the fault, below the fault? Who delivered the ads and in what time? Was it a publisher buy or purchased on an exchange? Did the campaign use search data, demographic, psychographic and or site activity as part of the media buying process? And how do we measure the impact of advertising with so many factors in play? So attribution, how did we get here? It's really more of an evolution rather than a revolution. Today, what we see at C3 Metrics is we see, on average, 32 multiple touch points of advertising. Who's getting credit for all the stuff that's in the upper funnel? The answer is nobody. So attribution is the process of taking a conversion or a sale or something of economic value and attributing it back, distributing the credit for it to the marketing touch points that were measured prior to that conversion. If you think about what, what a CMO's problem is, it's th they're trying to manage holistically a campaign, a set of objectives with their audience, with their potential customers, or with their actual uh, customers, regardless of the silo. So, you know, whether it's search or display or video or mobile or social, 
the opportunity for businesses is to move beyond the notion of having a perfect answer and instead be able to take data that allows them to make directionally and incrementally better decisions. As much as we talk about how last click is a problem today, it's enabled incredible optimization, right? Just think about the performance that you're able to get out of search advertising based on last click attribution. But last click, everyone agrees, is imperfect. So if we can just begin to think about how to move incrementally beyond that without having to focus on the perfect answer, we can really begin to see those gains. The CMO needs to optimize where they're spending money, how they're spending money, how campaigns across different sectors interrelate to one another. And historically, that's just never been possible. We never had attribution. We never had, had cross-channel attribution because we didn't have the available data. In a perfect world, every time you show an ad to an individual, you would know exactly how you influence the consumer. You would know which ads were working, how they were working, what the action was, and how you should adjust the media mix in real time across every medium and with which data. All right, panelists, come on down. So uh, I'd like to introduce the panelists, um, starting with John here. Uh, John's with Ad Adobe. He runs um, uh, product marketing for their advertiser products. Um, so he's very familiar with all of their attribution tools. We have um, my friend Paul, who's been doing this panel with us from the beginning. And he started, we started doing this panel with two companies, Odometry and Google. Only now they're one company, <laughs> uh, just Google. I guess, odometry powered by Google, is that Adometry right? Odometry by Google is what we're saying. Odometry by Google. Yeah. So all the drinks are on him afterwards, <laughs> personally, <laughs> just for reference. Uh, and then also uh, Jeff, who's been with us from the beginning, uh, runs C3 Metrics. Um, uh, in his part time, he's uh, a magician. So I think you'll find him particularly ent entertaining. And then representing some of you from the audience, as well as uh, a, a lot of other products that AOL has, including Convertro, which is obviously an attribution. Uh, 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 we have uh, Phil, who runs in the international business for Adapt TV. So he can talk to you about how uh, attribution has been important to video and to uh, AOL as a whole, enough so that they went and bought an attribution company. Um, so before we start, a couple of things about the panel. Uh, we really love it when you ask questions, so I'm gonna, we're going to discuss a topic, and then we're going to go out to the audience and, uh, and get you to ask questions, hopefully. Um, we're not going to wait till the end. Um, but let's also start by finding out who's in the audience. So let's just assume that, hands up, you all buy digital media. Yes? 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 Anyone buy offline media, television, print? Excellent, excellent. So we have a little bit of a mix. Um, uh, Phil, why don't you start us off, level set, Sure. what is attribution? Like, what, what is it? Why do we care about it? Uh, and then we'll move on from there. Yeah, um, great question to open up an attribution panel with. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I th I, you know, speaking from Adapt TV and, uh, and AOL in general, like, uh, attribution, we think, is a, is a game changer from our perspective. Um, and I'll kind of explain, well, I'll hopefully explain why is, uh, you know, we have been very vocal about what AOL is doing. Uh, and I think with the acquisition of Adapt TV by AOL, we can see that AOL is, is, is looking to build a product um, and a platform and a one platform that will enable us to trade programmatically across, uh, across many platforms, whether that be display, mobile, linear TV and video. But one of the key missing parts of that was an attribution modeling product, right? And um, that was the one of the main reasons, and I was chatting outside someone earlier about, you know, to really understand why AOL would, uh, would purchase a product like Convertro. Because for us, you can have all the products and all the automation, all the technology, but without being able to attribute, um, then what is it really, you know, what is it really offering? And, uh, you know, one of the, what the guy said in here uh, on, the, on your video was like, what did the upper funnel get? Nothing. Right. Uh, so for us, att attribution is a massive part of our strategy as we move forward. Um, 
And you know, again, on the video we're talking about last click. Well, for us, it's about multi-touch. Uh, and I can't remember the guy. I think it was David David Wanamaker. Who it said, yes. you know, fifty percent of my marketing budget is wasted. I just don't know which fifty percent it is. Well, hopefully, with with uh, with one and with us introduce introducing attribution to that, we'll be able to help answer one of those. Help, sorry, help answer that part of that question. So. So as we begin to dive in, let's talk about what key performance indicators people use today, um, you know, either with or in lieu of a full-blown attribution. What, what, you know, so, Paul, key performance indicators. So first I have to say, in nine events that we've done, these are by far the most comfortable chairs <laughs> we've had the cha opportunity to sit in. So well, kudos to, to Jody or whoever was able to make these chairs as comfortable. And, and clearly Phil is smarter than all of the rest of the panelists because he has his champagne. No, it's not mine. Oh, it's no, not it's yours. Oh, yeah, it's, it's Jeff. Jeff, of course. Oh, I actually um, picked this chair because it's closer to the door. <laughs> 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 so, um, so KPIs. What, um, you know, I think what's really interesting about attribution is a lot of times the actual KPI doesn't change in some ways. You're still looking at a cost per action. It's just the underlying data to calculate that cost per action really changes. So you're, you're allocating credit now differently. Um, you're still looking at the same metric. It's still a key performance indicator. That's in general. There are other metrics that you start looking at because when you have attribution, you can start actually teasing out not just how much credit different ads get, but how much credit they get at different stages of the purchase funnel. So you can actually look at what ads do the most effective job of introducing someone to my brand. You know, first ad that should get measurable credit for moving someone down that path to, to purchase. What are, the, what are the ad units or the parts of my media campaign that do the best job of, of promoting someone get, you know, in between to the last event that gets credit for closing someone? And so, so it's, a, it's, it's a lot of just a lot of the same metrics, but just calculated more accurately. And then with attribution, it gives you new data to help you create some new KPIs. I think I'm, I'm going to disagree with that because I think okay. it's important to That took five minutes, Jeff. I'm That's sorry. Why. <laughs> so... I think it's important to understand that when you when you migrate yourself and your business from last click to full funnel, it, it's a whole different lens. And although it still may be a CPA, it still may be a return on ad spend, it, you need to call it something different. And the reason you need to call it something different is because you're looking at things through a different lens. And one big mistake you can make if you're a stakeholder at, at, at a company or if you represent an agency and you work for an agency and you have a client, if you do attribution and you say, here's CPA, then things are going to be different. The numbers are going to look different. You need to call it something different. I even if you just say, this is attributed CPA, you, you, ne you need to understand it's a completely different lens because when you go from last click to all of a sudden splicing things up, the numbers are going to look completely different. And part of the problems that we run into as vendors is the whole change management process. And just understand, and we'll talk about it later, but it is a long process to go from being either a display network or being an agency to where at the C level, the numbers are accepted as the numbers. We're managing our entire business based upon the new version of the truth. That process can take as long as a year, if not longer. And so it's important that you call it something different so everybody understands that this is a different lens. This is a new way. We have a new way of looking at things. John, how, how, does, how does Adobe think about key performance indicators? What do you, what well, do you tell your clients? Can, can I just object to something yeah. straight away? Um, the marketing funnel. Every time I see that, and I've seen it a million times, it's always that the funnel goes down like this. Uh, we have ours on the side. It should, be up, it should be the other way around. There's this idea that gravity is somehow pulling those conversions through the funnel. Right. And it's not. You're pushing them up. And it's really hard. So I think that, that's the first thing. I think the second thing is, um, yeah, KPIs are KPIs, right? Yeah. It's margin. It's profit. It's whatever, whatever drives your particular business. I think the piece that's missing from attribution is it kind of tells you what's happened. And yes, you understand what's con contributing where. But, well, you know, so what? What, what am I going to do different tomorrow because of that information? So I, I need it to be predictive as well. It tells me if, if I'm going to change my media mix, how should I change that? And I need it to be prescriptive as well. So actually, I don't want to make that decision. I want, I want to know that this is a better media mix. 
And then the elements that you have to consider there are not only you know, the order in which events happen, but also what can I, how can I actually pull those levers? Because, um, you know, branded search, I'm already number one. I can't buy any more branded search. I'm probably better off actually putting that money into TV. So how do I understand what that elasticity of the media is, given that I can't always just take a million dollars from here or a million pounds and stick it over here because I just can't go and buy more of this stuff because it doesn't exist. Mm. And I think that's, that's something that brands, agencies need to figure out. And I think we're doing that for clients. That's the, I mean, what we've seen over the last two years in particular is, well, really three, four years ago, it was pretty much, at least for us, it was mainly a display search problem. Now, attribution is any and every digital media channel, and more and more it's including offline media. And also what we've seen clients coming to us for to do is coming and saying, look, I want a measurement platform that helps me understand all media performance, digital and non-digital. And so we've started bringing in media mix capabilities to complement what we do from an attribution standpoint. And we're doing some things to fuse those methodologies together so we can provide that real full end-to-end -end reporting platform around media performance, whether it happens online or offline. So before I go, uh, the next question I want to ask these guys is how do you actually implement uh, you know, a, a, an attribution model beyond post-click? Um, questions from the audience? Anyone got any yet? Yes, over there. I've got a question. Could you, uh, could you tell us who you are, where you're from, and actually I even have a mic somewhere. See if this works. Where's this go? Look at that. There we go. Uh, my name is uh, Clement Barley. I work for the, um, I work for Analec to finish it sort of like the big data arm of the, um, of Omnicorn called Media Group. Um, and my question is, it's following on from something which um, Jeff was talking about earlier on when you were saying sometimes it can take organisations around about a year to sort of adapt to moving across and um, viewing attribution through a different lens, especially when we're talking about measurement, etc. Um, what do, when you're talking about they they're starting to they takes a year for them to make the change. How would you how do you know when a, when a, when a client actually gets it? I mean, kind of what do you what do you deem as sort of the goal to them actually getting that throughout the organisation? How do they look at things differently? How do they organise themselves differently? Just to well, it's when they kick out the Adobe products. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> It okay, it the Google crack's coming next. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. Just going right down Careful the line. Careful which doors you open. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're good, yeah. We were just about to buy you as well. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so, typically, uh, if we talk, let's talk about larger clients. You know, larger clients usually have an agency that's involved. So, typically, the agency will come in, they'll use attribution, they'll use it to enhance and improve their ROI. They'll start sharing the reports with the clients, their stakeholders. Now, their stakeholders are typically not C-level. Their stakeholders are the marketing people. And the marketing people, they, they start to spread it around. And then usually we know that things are moving along when we hear that the SEO person at the client is interested, wants to have a call. When the SEO person at the client wants to know where they fit into the model, that's a good sign because that tells us that things are making their rounds through the client, and it's like, hey, I, I, I want to make certain that I'm not going to be ignored. So then we usually have a, several conversations with the SEO person, let them know, hey, this is, you know, you're part of the model, everything's in there. And because what ends up happening is that everybody has to give their blessing. Every stakeholder, not just internally, but uh, I'll tell you a story. There's, a, there's a, a large retailer in the U.S. like several years ago, and we were brought in by a display network that brought us in. They got the client all excited, all the display networks were all on board, everything was tagged, everything was perfect. Client was excited. All we needed was a search agency to send us daily reports of what they spent. And they were worried because the model may show in their minds that they weren't doing so well and their budget could get cut. So we never got anything. And then it turned out the search agency had been there longer than the CMO. And they talked to somebody internally on the board of directors. And six months later, everything was shut down. And I'm like, oh my god, a vendor shut down attribution. How can this happen? And it just taught us very early on that you need to get everybody involved. So, and, and, and that kind of leads on to the idea that, you know, we see 
there's a lot of concern. I mean, this is about change. You know, this is this is this is really about change. And and any time within an organization that you insert change, there's a chance that it can go well or it can go bad. If it goes well, you're a hero, which means raise, bonus, great. If it goes bad, it means it's time to look for another job. So we always tell people that contact us that when they reach out to people into their, uh, into their organization, into the other stakeholders, that they don't say, we brought on board a new a an attribution vendor. We always say, we're doing an attribution study. Why? Because no one ever gets fired for buying IBM, and no one ever gets fired for doing research. Research is a good thing. Research means, hey, there's knowledge to be gained. So it starts as research, which means all I'm expecting from you is some insights a couple months down the road. You produce those insights, you're a hero. And so what happens is there's some insights, the SEO person calls, it makes its way up, and then before you know it, these reports make their way up to the C-level, and then what ends up happening, this becomes the main source of, of the reporting. And then, as Paul said, what ends up happening is the C-level says, you know, this is great. Before, digital was all messed up. We do a million pounds a week in sales, and TV reporting said a million pounds a week, but digital said 12 million pounds a week because all the over-reporting. Now, digital says a million pounds a week, but so does TV. Is there any way we could put these two together? That's when things start to happen because that's when we can bring TV into the digital, mm -hmm. and now that's when things really take hold at that point. So I guess I would, I'd answer that in 15 seconds, um, <laughs> which is uh, uh, it's change management. People have been measuring last event for 15, 20 years, and so you don't just completely change the way you measure results right away. There's a lot of what Jeff said that's true, the you know, circuitous path that you get through to get there. But at the end of the day, it's, uh, it's, it's change management. You're coming in with stuff that's really different. I like to say people cli clients hire us because they expect us to show them radically different results. They hire us. We show radically different results. And they kind of like, ooh, wow, ooh, that's hard. And so then for us, it's how do you find that low-hanging fruit to get people comfortable so you get them on the journey. And, um, and then ultimately, you have to also deal with the CFO. Um, in big companies, because that's the person that really controls what the budget's set for. So um, it, it, from that standpoint, it takes time, right? And it, it, you think a year's a long time, but it's not when you compare it to the 15, 20 year history we've had of measuring results the way we're measuring them, you know, we've been measuring them in the past. So at the risk that of- That was more than 15 seconds. Yeah, no, I, yeah. I, I, I <laughs> totally was. agree. Can I just say something quickly, because there was a point that, um, that John said earlier about attribution, and I just want to just stay on that point for a second, if you like. Attribution, we do attribution, then we, we look at it and we go, so what? And I think that's a really important point, right? Because what we're trying to do is like take away that so what and be able to see attribution in real time and make decisions in real time. Yeah. So bringing an, attribu an attribution model to a real time platform to be able to make decisions based on data that you're getting in real time to how to optimize across you know, mobile, linear TV, mo uh, uh, video, desktop. So I think that's a really important point, is like sometimes attribution can be seen as, well, I've done my attribution, so what, what am I going to do? Mm -hmm. um, if we move that into a real-time environment, then you actually can have actions that you can activate straight away. Sorry to go back. But mm -hmm. yeah. No, that's okay, but that's, but that's not just AOL. I mean, no, 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 not at all. Yeah, I, I mean, think it's every, yeah. every No, no, Jeff, it. unlike you and Paul, he was actually making a general comment. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Right. <laughs> it's about bringing it, not just into yeah, AOL no, you're or right. TV, it's got to be real-time environment. <laughs> So at the risk of turning it into the, uh, into the Jeff and Paul show, which we won't, but I'm going to have you guys go at each other for a second here because this okay. is sort of my favorite part of, Embracing. The, of the evening. Is, is they both have very <laughs> different views on uh, how to implement attribution, um, and uh, which, which is great, which means that you have choices, right? So um, that there, there isn't actually one way to implement at attribution despite you know, every vendor will tell you that there is, but that bec because they tell you different things, there must be different ways to do it. And so I'm gonna let, I'm gonna let you go first, Paul, and then Jess, I'm gonna let you take cheap shots at him. All right, thank uh, you. Because awesome. it's your speciality. <laughs> um, uh, and, then, uh, and then we'll have the other panelists comment as well, and, and uh, I've got some questions for um, John after that. But why don't we start with how do you implement it? What's your, you know, what's your philosophy behind it? And then we're going to go uh, to John. Yeah, so um, for us, there's, uh, there's simple rules-based attribution versus a data-driven algorithmic approach. 
Um, last event or last click attribution is a rule. It's an attribution rule. We decide to give all the credit to the last ad seen or clicked on. Um, you can come up with other simple attribution methodologies. And those may or may not work, um, but we think it's only as good as the rule you come up with. And you know, a lot of times you can make things look better by just picking the right rule. You want to make earlier funnel activities look better, just give more credit to earlier funnel activities. But that doesn't tell you what's really happening. And so you know, the only way to do it is to let the data tell you um, exactly how to do that. And that's the approach we take. Um, I could bore everyone to death, you know, pull out slides and tell you how we do that. I won't. Um, I'd be happy to talk. Him. Yes, that's right. I tried <laughs> uh, every time, but um, um, you know. But um, we, we just think that's the more accurate way because different media performs differently for different clients, and it performs differently at different times of the year in different situations. And so, um, we just think that's the best approach. And you can do that in a way that allows it to be implemented. You know, we all have the same data collection issue. We have to collect all the raw data. That's a big challenge. But once you get the data, once you do with it, I think there are different approaches. We take a data-driven approach. We want to be as accurate as possible. Um, and that, that's a thing that I think distinguishes us. I think that's a, it's a very sexy statement to say, let the data decide. Because when you, when you dig into the literature in terms of what the education folks say, the PhDs say about how they crunch through the data once they get it, there's so many different ways to look at the data. There's a Bayesian approach, there's game theory. You could take 10 PhDs, stick them in the room with the exact same data source, and you would come up with 20 different ways of looking at the data. And so our approach in terms of looking at this market, and, and I come from this from a different angle. I, I actually started C3 Metrics six and a half years ago. And I realized that there was a problem in media measurement, not just online, but offline overall. Measurement was broken. But the problem was is that companies were stuck on this kind of last click methodology. And to take a company that's been around 50, 60 years and expect them to go from something that's completely transparent where they can easily see it. I can draw it. I can get it. Everybody understands last click very simply. To get them to transform from that to an algorithmic approach where the, it's data driven, that's, that's a, that's a, that's a multi-step process. That takes a long time. So for us, the way that we look at it is that we see that there's a multi-tier approach. Our goal at C3 Metrics is to get people off of last click. If I can get them to understand that there's some full funnel value, if I can get them to understand that there's problems in the marketplace, such as viewability, such as ads jumping in at the last second, uh, where we can clean things up, they can get a better, clearer focus, and then maybe have a conversation where they can set rules, where they can say, well, I think the upper part of the funnel should maybe get 50% of the credit. And then someone else says, well, I think it should get 60% of the credit. And, and we're like, well, Maybe you're both right. Let's run all those models, and then you can compare. That's a great argument for you as an agency, potentially, to have with the CMO of a company. That's fantastic. But at the end of the day, I mean, the reality is, is that our rules-based approach is really a marketing tactic. It's just to help people. It, we're really algorithmic, but it's just how we approach it. We don't believe that there is a right methodology. It just happens to be that they have one scientist who has one methodology. We believe at our heart that there's a million different ways to crunch data. And so for us, we feel as though that the advertiser or the agency should decide how they want to give up credit. And they should be able to say, well, this PhD from Minnesota came out with a new method last month in this article, and I'd like to be able to click a button and use their methodology to crunch through it. And maybe I'd like to compare that to this person in Norway. That's what we think the advertiser should be able to decide versus saying, I'm going to bet m the entire house with one scientist. We have a question over here, the man with the jacket. Hello, um, my name is Ori. I am in charge of Omnicom's attribution model, um, a data scientist by title. Um, question is, I mean, we might be talking about a year prep of the executives to accept the idea, or we might be talking about real-time attribution here. Uh, and we might be scientific about it and let the data decide, which is something that I wholeheartedly s support, I suppose. But Or we may be agnostic about it and say, let's roll the dice, let's try everything, and let's see what looks sexier, right? I mean, the question is, how do you test that? We want to have someone else take a go at this. Yeah. You wanna, John, you want to you wanna have a swipe at that? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, I love it when point solutions fight. <laughs> makes my job a lot easier. But, um, 
What, a, what attribution solutions does Adobe have? <laughs> <laughs> so I think. Well <laughs> okay. <laughs> Said. Okay, let's let's just. I'm going to talk about. Our let's focus on the question from yeah. the audience. Just. I'm just answering then, the question from uh, our panelists. <laughs> yeah. So let's let's come back to that media mix thing I was talking about, which is a product, by the way. Um, and you know, if you want to remind me it, not to let the panelists drink beforehand. And <laughs> then I'm out. So you you can't possibly test all of these combinations, right? You you you'll never get to any kind of statistical certainty across any of it. Um, and I think. The other issue you've got is d data is inherently flawed as well. So even in an online context, you've got multi-device issues. Um, if you're bringing in offline, and you've got to talk about offline in this context, right? TV is such an important piece of uh, media. Um, you know, things are flawed there. I mean, like, you know, talk about real time, and, you know, barb data comes in overnight. Uh, does anyone here buy radio? Yes. How do they yeah. measure radio? It's a, <laughs> <laughs> it's a diary, isn't it? I know. And people are in the car. Di I think yeah. there's 4,000 people, or something like that, who fill in a paper diary and submit that every week or every month or whatever it is. Right? So. That's crazy. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Can we all agree on that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it I is crazy, but agree. people are buying media on that, and you know, radio is probably you know is not the biggest medium in the, it going, but um, you know, there's still a lot of money put towards it. So, um, you, I don't think you can do the statistical testing that you, you're talking about. You can't be like A, B, and you know, who's which which CMO in his right mind is going to say, oh, that's fine. Let's spend six months figuring this out, because um, he's not going to be in a job at the end of that six months. So, I think. Um, you have to try and make some predictive steps. I'm, I'm not sure I agree with that concept that you, you know, just throw a load of rules at it and see the one you like, because if that's what you're doing, you've already made your mind up about what the attribution model is, and so you might as well not bother, right? You've made your decision, save a lot of money on vendor fees and just go with it. Um, <laughs> so I agree with you that you've got to let the data lead, and then you've got to figure out how you can do some kind of, um, hopefully get that to give you some kind of prescriptive modeling and see how that models those models bear out in reality. But it's it's always going to be a horribly imperfect solution. So because I ultimately, I haven't finished. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I took a breath. That's ultimately, all Jeff needs. <laughs> ultimately w what we're trying to do with attribution is predict, is to, to read people's minds. Right? We're trying to say, what influenced you to do that? I bought these shoes not so long ago. I'm very pleased with them. I can't really they tell you shoes. how I came to the decision to buy those shoes, right? I don't, I don't know. And for, for anyone on this panel, me included, to, to suggest that there's some mathematical model that can tell me how I came to buy those shoes is obviously ridiculous. So let's, let's just take a step back from rules versus algorithms and just think about the imperfect um, problems, uh, the imperfect solutions we're trying to uh, drive towards this particular problem. Well, I think it's, it's less about the shoes and more about the socks is where the issue lies. <laughs> um, cool socks, too. But I, I think you, you hit on something very important, John, which is it, the, the data, and any data scientist knows that it's your data collection that matters more than anything else. And you can apply any model that you want to the data, but if you've got bad data, it doesn't matter how you crunch it. So the key is, is that how you filter that data. So what's most important is that 68%, 70% of all display ads are never seen. They're never seen. In the UK, we did a study about a year and a half ago, 55% in the UK. In the US, it's about 70%. So what you need to be able to do is filter that data out and throw out the ads that are never seen. Then there's ads by virtue of the fact, is there anybody here from Facebook? Good. So <laughs> Facebook, when they rolled out FBX, one of the things that happened is how many of you throughout the day, at least half the time during the day, have a tab open to Facebook? Raise your hand. Most of us do, right? So what happens when you're shopping, in the middle of shopping or buying something, you're going back into Facebook multiple times, you're getting retargeted, those ads push out view through cookies, they end up jumping in and getting credit at the last second. So not only do you have the ads that are seen, those are ads that are, uh, not only have the ads that are not seen, but those are ads that are seen but jump in that have nothing to do with it. So what we call those are last second ads that just showed up. So those also mess up your data collection as well. So you need, once you filter those out, those last second ads, the ads that aren't seen, and then the brand search, 
which is when you think about your typical conversion funnel, AIDA, awareness, intent or interest, desire and action. When somebody says, I'm going to buy that or I'm going to do this, in the online world, they actually have to get there. In order to get there, they have to navigate there. So that navigation becomes part of your data collection as well. So you need to filter that out. Once you filter those all out, what you're left with is you're left with a very clean data source of folks, of touch points that are actually responsible. How you crunch through those, you can go scientific, you can go rules-based, but at the end of the day, you can end up with an R square that says, hey, this is the right way to do that. But there's different ways to come to that. So I disagree in the sense that we can get a very, very clean data source on the digital side, and you can correlate the, on, the offline on top of that and get very, very close in terms of a measurement. I mean, it's a lot better than it was five years ago. It's mm. not going to be perfect, but, it, but it's pretty damn good. Well, I, w I wouldn't be down Facebook. I mean, I think if there's, if there's any media owner out there that is closest to unifying desktop and mobile, it's Facebook. Um, you know, it's an always logged in environment. Um, it's Google, Facebook, and Twitter are the three that have that capability. Who says Google? Facebook, <laughs> <laughs> Facebook, Twitter, and Google, probably. <laughs> um, but, you know, Twitter doesn't have the scale that the That's other right. two have. So, um, but I think, I think Facebook have got a very compelling proposition. And, you know, they're talking about their ad products in terms of, you know, targeting users rather than cookies. It's, it's, it's something that I think is, has got legs. And, you know, as they're, they're growing that out into the, um, the, the mobile ad network that they, they announced not so long ago, then that, I think that becomes a very compelling um, proposition. It's got legs until you measure it. Until you have a client that spends money and they pay for it. We've seen it not work for clients, we've seen it work for clients. I've seen, I've seen clients where they've paid for 10 or 20,000 clicks and they looked at their raw Apache logs on their own site and 7% of those people signed up, actually made it to the site. So we've seen a lot of issues with Facebook in terms of that. It is a very compelling, great, big picture, ooh, this seems to be nirvana here, but it, it, for a lot of clients, it hasn't worked out for them. Uh, before I go on to the next question, we, we've seen it work I have a, we have yeah. a question from we've the audience, far it's more important, important than you guys arguing. Yeah. Sorry. Over here, yes. Um, wait, for the, wait for the microphone. Yeah. We can hear you, but everyone else can't. Yeah, people behind you can't hear you, that's the issue. <laughs> there you go. Uh, hi, my name is Anna, and I'm from iProspect. Uh, my question is, it's really, everything sounds really perfect and ideal. You get the data, which is fantastic. Obviously, as an agency, we can provide you with thousands and thousands of data every day. So once you clean out the data, that is fine. In a perfect world, everything is ideal. But how do you make the first decision to come up with a recommendation to say, look, after collecting all this data, this is the first recommendation. This is 40% in affiliates, 20% on display, 50%, I don't know, whatever, to PVC. How do you come up with the very first recommendation to the client? Which panelist wants to take that one? I'm going to give it to you, Paul. No one else volunteered. Yeah, so I think um, usually what we find when we start working with the client, first you have to have good data. We've touched on that. If you have crappy data coming in, you're going to have crappy results. So that's the most important thing. And also tied to that is you need to make sure the client feels comfortable with the data. So if you're collecting the data through tags, you need to reconcile it and make sure it ties out to your ad server and to other things so that, again, you trust the data. If you don't trust the data, you're not going to trust the results. Then we usually take this approach of let's find that low-hanging fruit. So we run all the, you know, the algorithms and come up with all the measurement, and then we find those things that the client's going to be most comfortable implementing, that the easiest thing to implement. It can be things as simple as frequency capping on your display spend. And then they get comfortable with that, and then you can start, you kind of move down the path of, you know, um, getting them comfortable. It's like, you know, no one jumps into the deep end of the attribution pool and to see if they can swim. You know, they start in the shallow end. So let's help them do that, get them comfortable and then move down that path. And then as they see success and they see it starting to have impact, that builds momentum that gets them more comfortable to go down the path. So that's so a perfect, I'm not gonna let you do this sorry. better. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's a perfect segue into the next question, which is, Let's talk about something that's been actionable. So you've seen a result, it's almost the same question, right? You've seen, you, attribution has been implemented. Give us concrete examples. You can feel free to delete the names of the clients if you can't tell us, but give us concrete examples of things that have changed as a result of attribution. Like what has actually changed? And Great idea. Uh, at the risk of putting you on the spot, Phil, because we haven't heard from you for a little while, I'm gonna have you go first. I was hoping you wouldn't let me go first. <laughs> um, 
You no, want to take a you want to take a pass on that and let have someone else go? No, first? no, no. You know, I, I never want to give up. Obviously, I'm. I, you, I think I should tell it's you. It's a good I'm, Aussie I'm straight. last minute on this panel, right? So yeah. Because uh, AOL purchase convertro, they just shoved me up here and said to speak about attribution, so I shall try. <laughs> um, ah, it's difficult for me to kind of really give you a good uh, comment on um, on a specific client because it's very early days for us. Right. But I think. Um, but when you when what you know when the when the yeah. discussions were happening yeah. when the discussions were happening at AOL about buying Convertro, yeah, there must have been concrete examples of why that was important, right? So it can't just have been oh, it's a strategy. I've never seen any data behind it. There must have been some conversations about, you know, we've seen this happen. We need to offer this, and this is the sorts of things that will change. I mean, why does it help? Why does it help AOL to to to, to have Convertro? Well, I th so two parts to my, to my answer. I think the first part is about w what we do look at is because attribution, you have to look at the spend, right? Because if you're spending different amounts on TV and online, then that can radically change the results. So one of the big parts about Convertro is they give us comparative re results around spend and attribution based on spend. So that was a big part for us. Um, but the main reason, and the main reason from a from an attribution perspective, was like it it, it just fitted in with our strategy, right? We w as I mentioned earlier, like one platform. But to be able to have that one platform, you need to have an attribution model. Otherwise, it, it doesn't really do anything for you. Yeah. You have to show um, advertisers what's working in their media mix, what part of that the funnel. How do I do the funnel? That that's the other way up. Conversions at the top. Conversions <laughs> at the top. So you have to be able to show. Our, you know, our clients in that funnel, what is working with them in that media mix. And, and, and without attribution, we can't do that. So that was the missing piece of the puzzle for us. Yeah. Um, so that was key. That was key to our decision. Jeff, concrete example of uh, things that have changed for a client. What have they done? Yeah, so, so for most of our clients, it's, uh, you know, they're usually coming in and they're looking at all of their different touch points. And Historically, they'll look at things like non-branded search is not working for them, display is not working for them, and they're able to go in and see when you're able to connect the dots, and you're able to see, because when you think about like the historical numbers that you deal with in digital advertising, 30-day click-through window, 14-day view-through window, does anyone know where those came from? Is any, anyone... Raise a hand if there's anyone here that's ever researched where 30-day and 14-day came from. Anybody? Back in the back, we got someone. Where, where did they come from? Pre-Google. Google? No. It's pre-Google. It's double-click. No? Pre-double-click. Porn. <laughs> Online porn. In the early days... You know, I mean, of all the panelists who would know that fact, I would have guessed, yeah. Jeff. Just are, are you sure it was, it was days and not minutes? <laughs> <laughs> it was hours. <laughs> hours, yeah. So that, that's where those came from. So they're so completely arbitrary. Uh, and, and there's never been any research based upon them. So all of a sudden, when you're able to go in and you're able to start measuring every single touch point, and you're able to see, wow... So, so, so some of the biggest takeaways for clients is the journey that customers go through from the first impression to the actual conversion process is much, much, much longer than anyone ever anticipated. For some of our clients, it's greater than 30 days, and they're shocked. And that changes their whole view of the customer journey. It changes their whole picture of how they deal with creative, how often they update creative. But probably one of the biggest things is non-brand search which historically has looked like a loser to them. Where they're like, I can't bid on this term on a CPA basis, it doesn't work out for me. All of a sudden now, you're able to see that those non-brand search terms, they lead to conversions later on. And I'll, I'll never forget, one of our first clients like five, six years ago, they did a, now I'm really aging myself now, they did like a $150,000 ad buy in a month on MySpace believe it or not, MySpace. And they bought, they, they signed an IO with MySpace for 150 grand. And the end of 30 days, this is before C3, it ended up with no conversion, zero. So they didn't do it. But they never understood why 
even with seasonality, why eight weeks later they saw a boost in sales. Didn't, didn't make any sense to them. So then we came on board and we're up and running and we're saying, you know, things are looking good. You should probably spend some more money. You know, maybe MySpace because it looked like you did it before. Oh, okay, let's do it. So they signed with MySpace again. The I.O. was done. They didn't re-sign with the I.O., but now we were able to connect the dots. Six weeks later, we saw these sales come in, but these sales were all originated from MySpace. And it was way outside that cookie window that was arbitrarily set. But we could actually measure it and see it and attribute it back. And then they went back and spent more money with MySpace. So John, uh, Jeff has three ideas there, right? One idea, um, the funnel could be longer, so he's had some clients that, uh, that, that extended. The second is branded search. And the third is that you should uh, buy from companies that are going out of business. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, the, um, uh, any concrete examples from, from you that you could share with us? Yeah, yeah, I can think, I think, I can think of two. Um, I mean, one is Adobe itself. Um, we've been running our own media mix product on our own spend, which is, you know, considerable, millions of dollars. Um, and, you know, what it taught us was our two most important channels were email and PR, which I don't think anyone in the marketing department really appreciates, um, apart from the guys in the email and PR. <laughs> um, <laughs> but that, that, that's kind of a, you know, probably it, it showed we were, probably should keep our pace search spend the same. I think it was, we were probably buying too many display impressions. But then the, channel is, the challenge is you can't just go out and do more PR. You can't just go out to the agency and say, we're gonna double your fees. I'm sure they'd be delighted, but, um, <laughs> and, and, you know, and, and generate more PR Models, for us. Right. That's actually, well, then we need to invest money in content marketing. Yeah. Right. So suddenly you get these, it, these perhaps non-obvious results of doing your modeling. Um, another example of a company I can't name is, you know, we saw a clear uplift of their TV, their tweets driving pay search, uh, which again is not. Oh, really? Yes. Um, again, not necessarily obvious. But yeah. um, so I think, I think the interesting thing is with a lot of this, it, it produces results that you might not expect, you might not like. And also isn't then just about changing the media mix. As I say, with, with email and PR, if you're gonna, you need to produce more PR stories, you've got to find more things to email people about. Yeah. That's actually a content problem then. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, then you're actually probably looking at your SEO guides as to help you with the solution to that. Other questions? Back there, what, we'll go to you second, you for uh, glasses, blue shirt. Do we have a mic? Yes, no? She's working on it. Top right hand corner, over this way I think, Peggy. Yeah, I'll run it for you. There we go. Thank you. So I'm Davide and uh, I'm in charge of the product team at Zatsis. Um, I have a question that is mostly for Paul probably. Um, we have, uh, well we have a to, you know, to Jeff's point, we've actually done some research on cookie windows, etc., and we see that the average life of a cookie is actually four days. So not that quite close to 30 as well. So it's arbitrary, of course. But um, my question is more about the tool. So finding out, uh, especially in digital media, cross-channel, uh, finding out uh, what's the best attribution model is great. Uh, but when you look at the tool, uh, for example, you look at DFA, DCM, etc., they are all based uh, mostly on the click uh, on the cookie window, last click uh, right. uh, attribution model. So don't you think that before actually changing uh, the brand mentality, there is a need to change uh, ad server, the delivery system mentality in ad tech? Yeah, so um, I mean, that's a great question because it ties into uh, one of the benefits I saw in um, being acquired by Google. <coughs> outside apart of the big from, check apart from the money, yeah. yeah it's <laughs> outside <laughs> of the big check <laughs> right. um, um, but you know, the, the, I, when I think about you know attribution, I've always talked about how important it is to have this separate you know agnostic measurement platform. But where I think that falls down is you know at the end of the day, we're talking about how you measure media performance, and when you're you know when you're judging media performance, you have to transact media, and it's they're intertwined, and so you know that's one thing that we're really looking to implement very quickly is tightly integrating our attribution solution within the various transaction platforms within the double click stack. So. DCM, they call it now. It's one thing about Google, everything's a three-letter acronym. 
everything. So um, it used to be DFA. We all remember DFA because it was always DFA for 15 years. Now it's DCM, Double Click Campaign Manager. Um, uh, uh, bid Manager, their Bid Manager product, and Dart Search. So that you can take attribution insight, that conversion insight, because you're right, those transaction platforms are transacting media using some imperfect measurement of conversion, typically last event or last click. And so you wanna push this more accurate fractional attribution insight with whatever platform you're using directly into those, plat those transaction platforms. So those transaction platforms can now buy media leveraging that more accurate fractional attribution insights. I call it like our Intel inside strategy. Um, and, and I think that's really important to, to really make our insights not just actionable or give you great insight, but actually make it scalable. If I give you insight and I'm on an island and I'm completely separate from how you buy media, it's gonna be really hard for you to take action on that or cumbersome, which means you won't do it, which means you won't get value out of our solution, which means you won't renew. So it's gotta be fully intertwined and that's one thing I think is really important going forward. There's another question in the back. Um, but I'm Matt uh, Lovell um, from Thomas Cook. Um, I guess it, it's kind of two questions that are kind of interjoined, which is, the first is, um, we've been talking about attribution since 2008, 2009, and there's been various levels of complexity that have been added to attribution systems, and yet most customers seem to find that there are some initial wins that you can have that make significant differences. Yes, the second that you can actually see that you're non-branded search or that your display or your email is, is having a greater effect, you can you can take that into consideration and um, adjust your spends accordingly. But then once you get beyond that and you start looking at your algorithmic approaches, the, 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 the volumes of changes are actually much less significant. And so actually, how essential is it, I guess, um, given that actually the incremental amounts are so small, could you not be better off spending your time and money elsewhere? And then the second aspect is, everything that's been talked about so far is about how to improve CPAs, when actually, surely the key focus of attribution is actually about how you give the right customer the right thing at the right time. Um, and actually that has far more to do with creative and, and actually understanding what that customer is in the mindset for and therefore what you can provide them with. Um, and that so far seems to be a miss, I guess. That was a great question. Why don't we give it to uh, you, John? Yeah. I think. We do have some creative products at Adobe. Um, I can't remember their names now. Oh, Photoshop. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, too. of course. <laughs> creative is, is, um, is, is a huge component. Um, and, yeah, when you mention audience and audience segmentation, I think that's, that's the other value the cookie brings is not just, you know, how long ago is it since this person did X? But also, what, what can I layer into that cookie that helps me understand more about that person? Are they, you know, can I, can I bring in my CRM information because they've logged in and I can see if they're a, a high value user to me or a subscriber to my newsletter or whatever it is? Could I buy in third party data from, um, you know, Experian or Exalate or whoever it might, might be and start to build a much fuller picture? of that and then as they come onto my site, can I start to use my on-site data to say, you know, how engaged is this person in, in what I'm trying to do? You know, are they dropping stuff into my, into a shopping basket? Are they watching a product video? What they ha how can I layer that information in? That, that can bring you an awful lot of gains as well without thinking about attribution. Um, and, and as I was saying earlier, you, you know, um, Advertising these days is more about putting valuable content in front of a consumer. And that valuable content isn't really a banner. Um, it could be uh, a useful tool. It could be, it could be uh, you know, a mobile app. It could be all sorts of things. All of that costs money to develop, cr you know, to get the right creative around that. And you've got to balance your media spend against your you're creative as well. So I, I agree with you to, to a point that there are, there are limited gains to be made by just thinking that attribution is going to you know, solve all of your problems. I guess the, uh, the first part of your question about you know, seeing a lot of gains in the beginning and then it doesn't peter out, um, we, we don't find that. Um, you know, we look at it as attribution really becomes kind of the measurement, the, the, the kind of ground truth 
the measurement platform of record. Um, and these campaigns that marketers are doing are just changing. You're constantly testing new things to improve performance. You just need to have a better, more accurate way of measuring that performance to figure out what's actually winning. So um, we, we see a lot of sustained activity um, from our clients, and that's reflected from the high renewal rates we get. So we don't have clients, if that was the case, we'd have clients that would use us for six months, and um, they'd do one study, and then they'd go away. Um, and that's not the case. We see it, we, you know, we, ca we, we think it's analogous to web analytics. You know, you wouldn't bring on web analytics, do a study, say, how's my site performing, and then go away. Um, just like that, you need, in a sense, advertising analytics or media analytics on how your media is performing. I think, I'll just add more to that. I, I think the big difference between offline and online is that in the online world, we have this GRP measurement, which is the same across all the different networks. So it's very easy. You create a model, and then I can do this model, and I can say, well, for every GRP I buy, I get X amount of dollars in sales or leads. I want so many leads a week, so I'm going to buy 50 GRPs a week, and I go from that, and it's good. I'm done. In the digital world, I can create a model, and I can say, well, you know, for every impression I get, every click I get, I get X number of sales, so I need X number of impression, X number of clicks. But all of us in this room know that one impression is not the same as another impression. A lot of impressions are not seen. It's a big difference between brand and non-brand clicks. There's a difference between affiliate clicks, display clicks, and stuff like that. So the problem that you run into is that in the digital world, the only way to actually manage your digital spend is based upon the numbers that you have to hit as an organization whether it's your CPA goal or your return on ad spend goal. So adding to what Paul said, your attribution platform becomes your, essentially your record keeper for how you manage your media. Because you can be buying through a DSP, or let's say even more sophisticated, you're buying, you have your own trading desk internally. You have a team of three people and you're buying through thousands of publishers. And all of a sudden, you know, things aren't looking that great. And it's because the quality of the impressions you're buying are gone because uh, Blizzard Entertainment came because they have World of Warcraft 22 that just came out and is blowing $40 million in three weeks to announce their game. That happens. I remember when they came to Yahoo and all the tier one inventory was gone. Well, guess what? All the people that were buying that inventory never told anybody else. So for our clients that were buying that inventory through DSPs, their quality started tanking down. So the only way to measure things is when you're using an attribution platform, as long as you're measuring based upon the numbers the organization has to hit, you can know, hey, I need to spend less with these folks. And then you can go out of those. So our clients that use us, we recommend to them that they have a 48 hour out with any ad networks they buy with, which if there's any ad networks here, they would freak out by that because they want you to sign on for a month. But with a 48 hour out, if you're an advertiser or an agency, you have a lot of leverage because you call them up and you say, what the hell's going on? Things aren't looking so good. You got 48 hours to turn things around, and guess what? They're able to turn things around that quickly because they'll just go on and buy better inventory. I, th I think there's one thing that there's, there's a whole unsaid thing in this whole conversation that I, I need to bring out here is that this whole conversation is predicated that there is an A for the CPA. And still, you know, FMCG, CPG, um, where there is not a transaction. And I think that's a huge challenge to, to attribution as well because not everyone is trying to get you to stump up your credit card details at the end of a journey. Um, you know, clearly that's true in retail, in, in, in travel, in your case. Um, but I think you know, if, if we think how hard it is when we can measure a transaction, the fact that then we're trying to drive people into Sainsbury's to buy that yogurt. You know, maybe iBeacons will have some kind of magic answer for us, I don't know, but. We're testing something like that now. So um, we're using Kantar everywhere. Shopcom data. <laughs> Kantar Shopcom has, it's like uh, Tesco data here in the UK, frequent shopper data, tied to individual users at an address level. We use LiveRamp in the United States to tie that data to our cookie, and that's allowing us, we're signing up clients now to test how their digital media at a user level drives people into the supermarket to buy a specific product. Crossing the bridge between. Next time you run this, get Dunhundy on this because they bought Sociomantic, which right. I think was yeah, one, of the, most one of the most yeah. interesting plays yeah. uh, this yeah. year. So, believe it or not, we have been going for over an hour, uh, which always shocks me that time goes that quickly. Uh, there are uh, a couple of questions that I want to ask. I want you guys to know that these guys are, uh, are around uh, for any other one on one questions that you've got. But there's 
to me, there's one elephant in the room which I, I have to ask. I've never asked this question before because it, I didn't really, it wasn't true. But today, there's one difference, which is that the attribution vendor that I used to have on the panel is now also selling media. So should we care? Two that of them the are, actually. The two of them, yeah, yeah. absolutely. So Phil and uh, Paul, should everyone out there care that, uh, you know, you're now asking for them to give you all of their data so you see how every campaign is performing and you're one part of that? Should, should, they, be, should they be saying, no, i got to use someone else, or should they that's still be embracing you? That's a valid you? question. I used to, uh, and now he's a colleague, I used to just abuse this guy on this panel <laughs> uh, in every city of the U.S. Uh, uh, from Google for that same question, right? So right. Fox in the Hen House <laughs> example. So, um, question to you. <laughs> yeah, now I have to answer that question, right? Um, so, I mean, at least as it relates to Google, um, uh, in a way it's no different than an investment bank. An investment bank has a buy side and a sell side, and they have a very strict Chinese wall between the two properties. Since um, 2008. Uh, uh, no, before <laughs> that, that. That's not <laughs> always historically <laughs> been true, has it, as it we saw with, that, actually, with that crash. It's illegal. <laughs> um, the stuff that happened actually wasn't because of the sell buy and buy side, actually, not to get into the financial crisis. Um, and I'm using it as an analogy, and I, I get that clients are going to be concerned about it, because I was an advertiser, a marketer myself. Um, but the reality is, is Google's been living with that Chinese wall between the, the platform side and the media side for 10 plus years. They created Google Analytics. They actually back it up in their agreement that they signed for their premium product now, uh, that there's complete data segregation and capability and can't share that data with anyone unless the client specifically allows it. Um, and they do the same thing with DoubleClick, um, with DFA. So, um, you know, Google's been living that. Um, I would not have sold the company to Google if I didn't believe that's true because you know I'm in this for the long haul. I'm, I'm here to solve the problem. I've been a marketer. So um, uh, we had other people we could have sold to. So um, uh, we wouldn't have gone that path if I didn't think that that would be the case. What we gain out of being part of Google is tying into the transaction stack, which is hugely valuable. Um, we gain lots of access to marketers because they have those relationships. Helps us talk about this problem. And we essentially more than doubled the staff of developers that were working on this. Google had a huge team doing this. We married that with our huge team. So we're just going to be able to go even faster. So um, it doesn't mean that clients, and uh, uh, to be honest, it's, it seems to be less of an issue for agency folks because they've been living in this world with DoubleClick a lot longer than it is with advertisers, at least mm -hmm. what I've seen in the last right. two months, that from a perception standpoint. Um, and we just have to, our actions need to continue to speak that, and we need to prove that to clients as we continue to work with them. Yeah, I agree. I, I agree that clients have um, are much more concerned about the situation. I think we've got a massive job to do. Um, I don't think we've got as big a job to do as Google, but um, we're in the same position. And I agree with a lot of what you're saying. You know, we we're, we're in it for the long haul as well. We don't. You know, we we have to have a separation between data. But, you know, we were having this conversation earlier, and you know, we can sit here all day long and say, yeah, no, no, it's fine. We're going to keep it completely separate. And it doesn't matter how many times we say that till we're blue in our face. There's always going to be that, are you really? Question. So we've got to continue to do and manage that and do a good enough job to people truly believe that that is what we are doing. Um, and, you know, there is no silver bullet that's going to suddenly go, oh, yeah, okay, I believe them now. Um, so it's, it's tough, but we, you know, we, we, we're in this position now where you've We've just got to keep on doing it and hopefully um, get to a place where everyone's comfortable. Right. And we, you know, we've chatted to a lot of clients about this specific problem, and and some have been, well, most have been fairly. After we've had a chat with them about what we're doing uh, from a business perspective, they're, they're a lot more comfortable. Right. But it's a, a continuous journey. So uh, can I just add in here? Sh sure. So, so I, I, I think it's important for everyone here to recognize that that still less than 1% of all advertisers use attribution. And so th that's important. And you know, we're only in the first couple of years of this now. And so we're just now seeing clients that have migrated from last click to attribution, and some of which that are happy with their, their vendor and then others that are moving on to another vendor. The cool thing that's very exciting is that the ones that, are, that were unhappy with their vendor, because that's a true test, are not going back to last click. They know that that was wrong, and they want to go to another vendor. But the takeaways that they're taking from this is very interesting. What they're saying to their agencies is, I want you to bring me a bunch of vendors. I want you to do an RFP process for me. 
but I want to own the contract because you may be replaced, but my measurement company is something that I want to keep for a very long time. It may live longer than you. So that's what we're seeing for clients that are on their second attribution vendor. They've learned. They don't want it to be owned by the agency, and they definitely do not want it to be owned by a vendor. Because what's happening here, it's as though NBC bought Nielsen. Okay? Imagine your ABC trying to compete against that. Okay? I'm just another attribution vendor. Imagine what Quantcast would say if they were sitting up here. They would have a lot more to say than I would. So what clients are going to want is they're going to want someone who does not have anybody vested. They don't want to have anybody that they can say, hey, I can point you to somebody at my company that can help you, even if there is a wall that's there, because there is really no wall. It all goes into the same bank account. They want complete separation of church and state. And that's what they're looking for. So I'm going to make one observation, which is just a question we haven't got to, which is about implementation. So we usually talk about barriers to implementation. And a, a, to attempt to give a sort of 60-second summary to it, um, which I certainly can't trust Jeff with, uh, <laughs> is uh, that it, it's, it's ungodly political and complicated to implement attribution uh, with any client. Um, people's bonuses can be affected. Uh, uh, how companies measure success can be affected. Um, and so if you run into these problems, you should at least be warned that they're going to happen, right? And that it's normal. Um, and, and, and in fact, something that you said earlier, Jeff, was that you need to start slow and you need to try to get everybody. Uh, and I think it was you who said, you know, when your C SEO guy gets wind that it's a good thing, that, that really is important. That the implementation, there are huge political barriers to implementation that you should all be aware of. Not that it's a reason not to do it, uh, quite the opposite actually, because that sort of barrier is usually erected for a bad reason. Um, so I'm going to end with one question, and then we would love to see you at the bar afterwards, and they'll answer more questions there. Um, and the last question is a soundbite question, which is, uh, and I'm going to start over there and move this way, except I think I'll have you go last, Paul, because okay. um, uh, <laughs> I know what he's going to say, so I want him to have an opportunity to say it last, it, which is, when you turn on attribution, give me one example of someone who loses. So, you know, someone, you turn them off, it just didn't work, you turned it on, you saw it, what just didn't work? Mm. And so that, that you can go away and look at that tomorrow, when you go into your offices, you can say, well, geez, these guys said this didn't work. And you actually can go and take a look and see whether it's working for you. I would say, and this kind of ties into a, something you said earlier, which is ad networks. I'm sorry if there is any ad networks in the room, but I mean, you know, a good point is when all the, when the good inventory is gone, you get bad inventory. And not only that, they have to compete with fraudulent activity, viewability issues, um, the fact that a, a lot of their business has been canalised by automation and DSPs. So for me, they're, they're a big loser in attribution. Ad networks is one. I would say it's the folks that jump in at the last second. And I, I would say across the board, the number one offender to that is Facebook. That looks great on paper, but when you actually dig into the data and really, really analyze, not at a high level, but dig into individual paths, you actually see that the data shows that th those folks that jump in at the last second actually had no effect whatsoever and driving the decision. They just happened to be there. They just showed up for the party at the last second. John. Well, uh, we were talking earlier, we were talking about branded search, and that's what I was going to say. But actually, uh, I'm, I'm going to disagree with myself, because I think <laughs> <laughs> a good example. We haven't had enough <laughs> arguing, so he's <laughs> turning to himself. <laughs> <time. Because That's> <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Again, you've got to look at price, right? Branded search never loses, because it's cheap. And that's what you've got to think about with all of this. If it's cheap, you're going to keep it. And branded search is threepence a click or whatever. Um, so I think you've got to factor that in. I think, you know, if I was a media planner in an agency, I wouldn't want an attribution tool telling me what to do. I'll just leave it to <laughs> <for> that. <laughs> Paul. Um, so um, I tend to take an optimistic view and say what, what tends to work better. And so... A lot of things that Jeff and Phil talked about were 
you know, lower value inventory. So, you know, what we see a lot of times is that higher value inventory, which has always been really hard to justify sometimes because it's expensive. Um, you know, quality matters. Quality of content, quality of ad placement matters. Um, and a lot of times you can justify things. We've seen that particularly with video of late. Um, we've seen video perform a lot better um, on a fractional attribution basis than a last event basis. Um, and so I think that's something to think through. And, and again, it just gets back a little bit to what Jeff said. You know, a lot of times that crappy inventory, it's so cheap that you just buy so much of it that it's just getting in front of people before they convert. It's not really helping them down that path. And that is it for this evening. Thank you so much for spending time with us tonight. Um, there's an open bar, and as I said, uh, it's coming out of Paul's personal bank account, so <laughs> awesome. do what you have to do. Thank you. Always a pleasure. Uh, always, yeah, definitely. Good to do another one. Yeah, yeah. John, it's nice to meet you. Nice to meet you as well. Thanks, Thanks John. Good show. Oh, yeah, yeah. Thank you very you. much. No, pleasure. Bill? Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Nice to meet you. Thank John, you. John, pleasure. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much.